Hello, and welcome to Aberone's Armorial. Today I'm going to talk about blazonry, the art of the blazon, basically the science behind all of armory. This video should be a lecture style, which I was trying to get away from, but I thought a standard video would not work very well for the format of it. So I'm going to go through the ins and outs of how to blaze on arms, how to describe them, that sort of thing. So there are two things that we need to cover first. That is the basic formula of how blazonry works. And then secondly, the commonly known rule of tincture. And I forgive any pronunciation on this. I have heard many of the charges, metals, colors, that sort of thing, all pronounced differently depending on who says it. Some of them are given a more English pronunciation or a French pronunciation or even a Latin pronunciation. So I'm gonna try my best and just explain them clearly. They will all be listed on the screen. Anything I say as a word that is important will be listed with examples. So the basic formula of all blazonry goes like this. First, there is the field mentioned. Then there is the ordinaries. Now the ordinaries are not mentioned when there's a chief or a border, as those are things added afterwards. So there's ordinaries, subordinaries, the primary charges, secondary charges, charges of honor. Now that may or may not include a chief. The chief can be either a division of the field, an ordinary, or a extra adamant of honor. So charges overall basically, and then marks of cadency in the end. So labels, borders, that sort of thing. The other thing we need to cover is the rule of tincture, which is basically metal color, metal color, that sort of thing, they layer. If you've ever worked on an editing software or anything like that, it's a very good analogy. You have to lay one item down before you set the next one. Now there are of course some exceptions to that rule and we'll get to that in a moment, but the general rule of thumb is if your field is a metal, then your charges or your ordinary should be colors and vice versa, that sort of thing. So they alternate, they layer. So first we're gonna talk about tinctures themselves. And all of these charts I have pulled off the internet and I have talked about them in the bottom at the end of the presentation about where they come from and there will be sources listed in the description. So the first set is the colors. Now the colors are ghouls, Azure, Vert, Sable, Purpure. Those are basically the five standard colors. Um, they represent red, blue, green, black, and purple. Now, there is some debate with some of these as to what shade of color they actually represent. I'll be the first to tell you, I'm actually a colorblind herald, so I'm not going to give advice on shades. However, I've heard it said that red is a deep and bright red, Blue is more of a standard royal blue. Green can be anything from light to dark. And I have seen this, especially with my grandfather's arm. My maternal grandfather has a banner where it is almost hunter deep, you know, deep forest or a hunter green. And one of the digital mock-ups I have shows it almost like a lime green. You know, so there's no set heraldic green. Black is obviously black. Purpure is the most complicated and most ambiguous of all of these as some people like purples as lighter bluish purples and some people like them as reddish purples. I think purpure sounds a little bit like Roman purpura, which is more red. So that's one of those things like green and purpure are very nice um, because you can increase and decrease the shades usually as well. The next set is the metals, which are argent and ore. So gold and or silver and gold respectively. Then there are three called stains. The stains are often considered colors depending on what chart you look at. Often they're not very common. I will also add as an adamant that any color can pretty much be, be used. Um, for example, blue celeste has been popular occasionally on and off over the past couple hundred years. And that's a sky blue. Um, there's some extra ones in there too, but pretty much anything can be used, but the general rule of thumb is stick to the set colors. If you're going to experience something, you can change the shade in the artwork itself. So like there's TN, which is either orange or a light brown, depending on who you ask. This chart shows it as orange. I thought, I usually think of TN as like a light brown. There is sanguine, which is 
like a blood red color. So like a more of a burgundy, a deep red. And then there's Murray, which is more of a mulberry color. There are also the furs, which represent more of a medieval-esque nature. Um, they were trims usually on cloaks. And today, if you see um, the robes of a baron or even the queen, they are usually trimmed in ermine. So that's a white fur with black spots. Ermines is black fur with white spots. Ermoise is gold with black. Peen is black with gold. So those are the main furs. There's also pepalone, which I don't see much. I don't think I've ever actually seen it on a shield. That's more of a fish scale. Vair and counter bear are both interesting as historically speaking, they were actually alternating squirrel hides. Yes, you heard that right. They were, they are meant to represent the hides of squirrels sewn together. Um, some people say it was rabbits, but every source I've ever read has said that it's actually squirrel hide. So it's actually the fur of the squirrel. And then the next squirrel that was sewn into the cloak would have been a, um, would have been the, the hide out. So it reverses. So that's kind of what Vare is supposed to represent. Poten is another one that's actually, um, if you look at it closely, it's almost a geometric pattern of crosses, but it's not a semi. There is a counter potent, and then there's plumity. Plumity is actually supposed to be feathers. Um, I haven't seen that much, but I have seen it recently a few times with the Canadian Heraldic Authority. So if you look at a few shields, they have done some that are in plumite. The next aspect would be the divisions of the field. So these are when the shield is actually cut in multiple parts. So for example, per fess, per pale, per bend, per chevron, per pile, per saltire, you get it. There are many different ways that this is done. Um, per fess, fess wise is in half horizontally, pale is vertically. A bend is always going to be from the top left to the bottom right. A bend sinister is the exact opposite. So sinister is to the right. Um, chevron, it's a chevron pile. It's an angle going down. Saltire is, there's an X through the shield. Now per saltire means it's divided into quarters, but at an angle. Quarterly is different. That's where it's actually cut into quarters like there's a cross. Gear, pardon me, gearany is um, like a pinwheel almost. Um, you see that on the Campbell arms and a few others. Checky is common. Lozenge is more of a continental thing. Bari is bears. Polly is um, pale wise bars. There's bendy, diagonal bar, chevron, you get the point. Um, there's other things like tears per pale or tears per s, which is like a tricolor. So those are the field divisions. Now, this is what I was mentioning about exemptions to the rule of tincture. So all of these ones, as you can see, are all divided azure and argent, some ways, either fess, pale, whatever. Now, in heraldry, some people debate this, but it's pretty much set in stone at this point that you can have a field division of two colors with charges of a metal on top of it. So normally I would say, you know, if you're dividing something per fess, it should be a color and a metal. However, if you divide it per fess and have it two colors, so say this is ore and argent or azure and ghouls, you could place a gold lion rampant over both of them. So it covers both. So it turns the division of the field into a full field of two colors, then it treats the whole field as if it's just a color. Um, I have a couple examples later of that, but it's one of those things that you don't see that often, but it's important that that is not a violation of tincture, it's just an oddity. And the next part is ordinaries. Ordinaries are simple. That's things like chiefs, a fess, a pale, a cross, bends, bent sinisters. See what I was talking about, how they reverse a saltire and a chevron. So these are usually the main things. Off, some people will think of these as charges. They are not. They are their own thing because charges can, can be placed on top of them. Normally, you don't overlay charges on charges. You lay charges on ordinaries. So these are the ordinary divisions of the field. And if you look at a medieval roll of arms from, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th century, a lot of the earlier shields, a lot of the basic older ones are just simple things like this. It's a bend sinister of a metal and a color or a fess or a cross or something like that. So these are the ordinaries. So for example, we're going to do a blazon. So this shield would be blazoned azure, a saltire, argent. 
So to break that down, it's azure, which shows the whole field of the arms, then a saltire, which is the ordinary, and then it describes the color of that ordinary, which is argent. So you have azure, a saltire, argent. The next part is subordinaries. Subordinaries are very similar to ordinaries, though they can be extra things. You don't see them all that much, but they are basically just extraordinaries, as I would rather call them. So that would be like a border, not a border as a mark of cadency, but a border as a stylistic choice. An oral, which is like a treasure, but it's thicker. You have inasuchian, which is a small shield placed over. Now that can be interesting as sometimes there are quartered arms where there are four arms placed together, marshaled together for some reason. Then there is a extra shield added over that would be inasuchian. Um, a pile is also considered a subordinary and an ordinary. It's weird, or a division of the field and an ordinary. Um, flaunches, I saw something today that had flaunches. Not very common, but it happens. A quarter, also known as a canton, you know, that sort of thing. Pauls, pauls are very common in ecclesiastical heraldry. A fret, now a single fret can be a subordinary or you can make something fretty, so it's a series of frets. Diminutives are next. Um, you don't see them that much, but they can be common. So fillets, bars. So a bar is smaller than a. So this is with the same with bars and with chevrons and bends. So you can have things like a bar, which is smaller than a pail, and you can have a chevronal, which is smaller than a full chevron, and a bendlet, which is near is smaller than a regular bend. They're basically just narrow. Um, there's also things like Freddy, like example, as I said earlier, and satorals and crosslets. These are things that are called semis. That's an extra thing. So for example, you can make a whole shield, a semi of fleur-de-lis. That was common for France for a long time. It was just a semi of lilies. Um, treasures, like I said, um, a treasure is just a thin line that goes around much like an oral. And you see that most commonly in the arms of Scotland. However, that's a double treasure, and that treasure is actually flory, counterflory. So it's actually alternating fleur de lis built into the treasure. Again, we'll get into that later. So the next thing we need to discuss is varied lines, however. Varied lines are basically that. They're lines that can change. So anything that can be described can be explained with these, also called lines of partition. The most common would probably be wavy. So sometimes you'll have a fess wavy. So it could be a bar across. However, it's a wave going across the shield. Or you can say that there's waves. So there's uh, arms that I've seen before that's on waves, azure and argent, a, you know, a lymphad sable or something like that. So it's describing that. Um, you can see potenti, which is like that. There is engrailed and invected. Um, embattled is also probably the Wavy and embattled are probably the two most common. Embattled just looks like battlements. Wavy is a wavy line. So any line that can be described can be described as that. Next thing to cover is charges. Charges are just the common symbols that go on arms. So that's the next part of the blazon. So, you know, here's a few just common ones, you know, anchors, a shell, a buckle, a hand, a mullet, which is just a star, um, an eagle, a cross, a horn, a lion, you know, there's Anything can pretty much be a charge. If you can find it, it can be made into a heraldic asset at some point or another. But each thing can be complicated. For example, there are several kinds of crosses. And believe it or not, this chart is not all of the heraldic crosses. There are several out there that are just crazy. There's, there's tons of them. There are all different styles, all different kinds. Some can be fitchy. So for example, any of these crosses, you see it in Scottish heraldry often. You can have a cross crosslet or you could have a cross crosslet fitchy, which means the bottom part is cut off to a point. And then there's of course beasts, for example, the heraldic lion. The lion, as with all animals, can be described um, in a variant of poses. For example, everybody has seen a lion rampant, if you've seen the Scottish arms. But if you've seen the English arms, you might be more familiar with a lion passant. Or there might be some arms, I think there's Flemish arms out there that show a lion salient. You know, each one of these things describe the form of the beast, the attitude, is this is what this is called. So 
and this is not specifically for lions. This is most of the mammals and some of the mythological creatures. Um, there is a full list out there in Stephen Fryer's Basic Heraldry, if you can find it. Uh, great book for beginners, but there's a whole chapter on the positions of beasts. Um, so same things here, like fish. There are three positions you can show a fish, Ninant, Ernant, and Heruant. Um, some things are normally described as volant, that's how butterflies are described. Um, Tigrant is sp spread out like a lizard, you know, there's, there's different things for every animal. So now we're going to do another blaze lightning exercise. And this we're going to display the shield on the right, but we're going to get there. And this is nice because it shows each part like a layer. So the beginning of this blaze on is Argent. Argent tells us it's a plain white field. Upon a chevron gules, so there is a chevron gules, so a red chevron, but there's going to be something upon that. Three crosses cooped or. So it's three styles of this certain cross that are in gold, and they're spread out over the chevron. So Arjan, upon a chevron gules, three crosses cooped or. Now we get into marks of cadency. I have a whole video, I have two videos basically on cadency. And you know, you can watch those if you're more curious how this works, but I'm gonna show you how they add in. So there's three systems shown here. They're the most common, the English system, the Canadian system, and the Scottish system. The English and Canadian systems both derive a set of um, basic marks. So in all of these systems, however, besides the Canadian, um, a label of three points, and it can be used any contrasting color or metal to the rest of the shield, but that marks out the heir, the firstborn son. Um, a crescent in the English system is a second son, but if you are in Scotland, the second son is depicted by a gold border around. Now, as you notice here, the borders are listed, a couple of them are listed as checky. Now that is done when the main color of the shield is either the main metal or color. So for example, the third sun on this system shows that, oh, well, the shield was also already Argent, so we had to make it checky, or sorry. Yeah, it was already Argent, so we made it checky of Azure. So now it's both, and that makes it not blend in as much. And I'll get in more, and there's an example at the end showing how to blaze on a mark of cadency into the shield. So we're gonna get into some examples in practice. And this is probably one of the simplest things out here. And this is also going to explain how things are depicted. So when there are items in a shield, they basically fill the shield automatically in a basic format, usually from top to bottom as the shape of the shield goes. There are of course some exceptions to the rule and you could specify that in the blazon, but normally it's a top to bottom fill. So for example, the arms of France or the former arms of France, azure, three lilies, or, and that is to say a blue shield with three fleur-de-lis or lilies spaced out. And those are labeled, since there's three of them, it's two up top, one in the bottom, filling the shield. Next example, the arms of England. Ghouls, three lions, passant, gardant, or armed and langed azure. So that is to say, a red shield, so a shield ghouls, the whole field is ghouls. There are three lions, passant, so there's three lions, and then their attitude is passant gardant. So they are stretched out as if they're walking, but they're gardant, so their heads are turned towards the viewer, and those lions are colored or. But they are also armed and langed azure, meaning their claws and their tongues are all done in azure blue. But say you want to show the heir to the throne. The son of the King of England would be the same blazon as the previous, as his father's arms. So ghouls, three lions, passant, gardant, or armed and langue azure. Then is added in the mark of cadency. It's the last thing down. That is a label of three points azure. Azure is only found on the shield in a small place. So to place a whole border of azure across the shield works. You may be wondering also why the mark of cadency can be placed if it's a color onto the field. You see, there's a lot of red touching the blue. It's an extra adamant to, it's the last layer. It doesn't really count. It's not an ordinary or a charge, so it doesn't count. 
And as you've noticed too, there's no ordinaries here. So if there's something in the list that we talked about back at the beginning, you just skip it, you just go through. So if you have this, then you use this. But if you don't have it, you go to the next thing in there. Now, the arms of St. Edward the Confessor. Azure, a cross flurry between five martlets or, so this is to say a blue shield. So a shield azure, the whole field is azure. There is a cross flurry. However, this isn't quarterly or anything like that because it's between another object. So these are five martlets spread around. Now, as the cross indicates and as the shape of the shield indicates, there is no need to say that one is below and the other four are in the open spaces, the voids around the cross. It's implied that because you can easily place four of them behind, between the points of the cross and the last one fits conveniently at the base of the shield, so in base. Now for something a little more complicated. This is the arms of uh, Clarissa, King of Arms, I believe. So this would be Argent across Gules. So that's the silver field with the red cross over it. But then we add the chief. The chief is a division of the field, an ordinary, whatever you want to call it, but it's a mark of honor in this case. So it goes at the end of the blazon. So you have Argent across Gules. So that's the main field of the shield. However, there's a chief. So on a chief Gules, a lion, passant, gardant, or. So that's the lion passant. And then it's armed and laying d'azur, which we can see, but we also notice it has a crown. So we say that it is crowned with an open crown or. I said crown a few times there if you hadn't noticed. Another thing you can notice about this as well is there are times when you can say things like of the last or of the second. I'm not going to get into that that much today and I'm not gonna show it because it gets confusing. However, if I wanted to, you could blazon this. Argent across ghouls on a chief of the last. So you could say on a chief of the last, the last color said. A lion, passant, garden, or. So you could say that as well. That's just one of the alternatives you can do. Not very common today, but still possible to be done. Now for our final test, we're gonna do the royal arms. So these are the arms of Her Majesty the Queen. And I'm gonna explain how they work because these are marshaled arms, but it gives an example to try out two other shields that we haven't done yet. There are varying degrees of complexity. There's an easy, so the, she, the arms of Ireland, easy to explain. The arms of England, slightly harder. The arms of Scotland being the most complicated here. So we're gonna walk this through completely from beginning to finish. So how we would do this is we would say it's quarterly. There are four quarters. So the first part we will break down is the quarterly first and fourth. That is to say the first and the last quarters. Quarterly, first and fourth. So that tells the position of the shield. Ghouls, the main color, three lions, passant, gardant, or the lions, armed and linked, azure. Simple, we've already blazoned this. We'll move on to the next one though. The second one is going to be the hardest arms that we've explained here today. This is the Royal Arms of Scotland. So this is second in the shield. It takes up the second quarter of the Royal Arms or a lion rampant ghouls, armed and laying azure. So we have the gold field, and the red lion rampant at the center of the shield with, uh, with a blue tongue and blue claws. But this is within, so this shield or this central charge is within another thing. This is the double treasure, flory counter flory. So that is to say it is a treasure, but there's two of them. So there's two treasures going around and then there's flory counter flory. So there's fleur de lis in them. However, they're alternating. So you can see that if you look at the top right, one is pointed out, the next one is pointed in and so on and so on all the way around the shield. So the second quarter is, or a lion rampant ghouls armed in a linged azure within a double treasure, flurry counter flurry. And lastly, the third quarter, which is azure, a harp or. Now we don't need to mention that fourth quarter because we mentioned at the beginning because two are the same. However, if there were four different quarters, we would say, First quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. Um, I had some contributors today. I looked, um, a lot of these diagrams came from either the American Heraldry Society or the arms themselves came from Sodkin Assens via Wikipedia. Um, there is better explanations in all of, um, all of these topics in Sir Arthur Charles Fox Davies' Complete Guide to Heraldry. I hope you enjoyed this. 
If you have any questions, as always, feel free to comment. Or if there is something you would like to see in another video, feel free to comment or email me there as well. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.